turn to Acts 16. The faith, the faith that failed not. Acts 16. The faith that failed not. Starting at verse 14. Acts 16, verse 14. Praise God. And a certain woman <clears throat> named Lydia, <clears throat> a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which are spoken of Paul. <clears throat> and when she was baptized and her household. And these first two verses in Acts 16, we realize that we never know who is hearing us and who is worshiping God. Recently, this article in the Lenox paper I think reveal that that reporter beautifully heard us. Because we, were, someone was reading the article again last night. It was a fantastic article. But her heart obviously had been touched by the Lord. So touched by the Lord that that she would she wrote the article as well as anyone here would have written it, and with the same spirit that they would write it. And. The reason, obviously, being that she attended under the things which the body said. You never know whose heart the Lord's going to open. So you never preconceive that someone isn't going to be saved or isn't going to listen. Over and over again, in difficulties, people begin to think, that so-and-so will not listen and will not be saved. But the Lord has his beautiful way of opening hearts. We received a card up in Poland Springs on the Sunday telecast from someone, and they said, when you gave the invitation, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I've never done that before. And I asked him to come in my heart. The Lord opened that man's heart, and he heard the things that we said. On the telecast Wednesday night, a Jewish girl called up. and She accepted the Lord and uh, called up here. And they took the call. And she accepted the Lord on that Channel 8 telecast. The Lord opened her heart and she attended unto the things that God said. So that's the most beautiful part about witnessing is if a person witnesses in the power of God, the power of God opens the heart. And if you witness in the flesh, the flesh profiteth nothing. So, when we go forward in faith and witness in the power of faith, then the Lord Jesus Christ opens the heart. And that's exactly what happened with Lydia, a seller of purple in Thyatira. This is exactly what we want to happen in Orlando, Florida. Shelton, isn't it? We've got a beautiful field. We want to have a telephone time ministry in Orlando. And we want to have a, a good, solid little team there. Because it's the fastest growing place. Because it's near Disney World. And I think we're about 35 minutes from Disney World. And we want... We've got some beautiful property. And... Uh, Four or five acres of it, right out in, right out in the old countryside, and yet near everything. And the property will be given over, where the word of God can be preached to Florida, in that section. And this is a beautiful thing. We have another piece of property near Homestead, Florida, and that's another, another section. But we we want to see the word of God go forth, and everything that we have, utilize to win the lost, and so people's hearts can be open and they can attend unto the things that God says. And this is a beautiful thing. I hope the science department finds that out in Richmond, Virginia, 
as they go and survey that land and consider that property in Richmond. I hope that they discover that too, that a team can be in Richmond as well as a large farm in Richmond, Virginia, <clears throat> because there's plenty of Lydia's in different places ready to listen and attend unto the things that the Word of God says, whether it be in Canada or Richmond, Virginia, or wherever it is. We have all these places in our little map ready to invade <clears throat> and ready to preach and teach. That's why our messages, like last night, are so relevant. You can't preach the gospel in all the world unless you've got people that are ready to preach the things that God is on God's heart. And they're ready to go and forget themselves and stop claiming anything for themselves and just let Jesus Christ completely lead them. Because if they are intelligent and if they are practical, they know that their days are numbered here. Psalm 90 says that. And all of our days are numbered in the 10th and 11th verses. And if your days are numbered... Why would you want to have a bad day ever numbered? I don't think you would. <clears throat> the late Dr. Bob Jones Sr., who's gone home long since to be with the Lord, about four years ago, he said it very well. He said, I don't have long to live. I've been in this earth for many years. My hair is getting gray and my eyes are not as good as they used to be. But he said, I'm still serving Christ. He said, one day soon, I'm going to be knocking, knocking at the door. He said, I've been knocking at the door all these years. He said, I'm going to be knocking <coughs> at the door. And he said, <coughs> St. Peter's going to be at the door. And he said, I'm going to be knocking he said, that door will open and I'll walk in. He said, it's going to be beautiful steps. He said, my hair is getting gray and my eyes are getting dim. But he said, can't hear as well as I used to. He said, I'm still knocking on doors. He said, that door is going to open. He said, <laughs> he said that door is going to open and I'm going to go in and Jesus Christ will be inside that door. And he said, I hope, uh, maybe he'll say to me, well done, Bob Jones, thou good and faithful servant. He said, if you keep on knocking on doors, he said, sooner or later, you're going to knock on the door of heaven. It's going to be time to go home. So he said, make sure you just keep on knocking on doors. Well, I think everybody ought to knock on doors and be ready to, to go in. <laughs> Praise God. Well, there's all there's all kinds of Lydia's and there's all kinds of peoples in Virginia and Florida and New York. We're going to do a live a broadcast today. We usually send tapes to New York City. Today, we're going to do a live at 10.30 and a few live broadcasts there in New York. It's, it, the signal beams right over the city. When we were in, when we were in New York, we just... Uh, Listen to the Bible speak so clearly driving down Broadway, and it was quite an experience to hear the ministry come over the radio there and WWDJ. And uh, I was thinking, we're going to do a, a broadcast in New York. We're changing our format. We're going to call it "Ask Your Pastor," and we're going to we're going to read questions, read questions on issues from the Word of God, and just discuss it just for change and see how it works. But there's all kinds of people in all these places. What we want and what we've got to do is to get people that will come to Bible college and be trained and then go out in large numbers into these cities and into these lands. People that will stay with it one way or another. And I think we've got a body that wants to do that. The crowd is thin here this morning. Don't we have more than this in Bible school, Joette? doesn't look like 400 to me. But anyway, we want this place filled because we want to send people in all the world to preach. 
to preach and to disciple because that's the only reason you're here. Ever in the world, that's the only reason you're living. Every single one of you and every single one of us are going to find ourselves either in the rapture or in a coffin before many years go by. And uh, I'll never forget when I was in Bob Jones, he said this. He said, he said I don't like the coffin. There's nothing about it I like. And uh, he said, I don't want to look forward to the day when they put you in the box and put the lid down. He said, I don't like that thought. But he said, I like the thought of knocking on the door of heaven. <laughs> and uh, I, like, <laughs> I like that thought a lot better, too. I... Uh, a lot more fun to knock on the door of heaven than it is to be put in a coffin and go into the ground and have them shovel up the dirt. And but uh, so we're just here to get people to knock on Jesus Christ's door so He can open it. There is no time for religious sentimentality. There is no time for wasting time in secondaries and just living to appease someone's sentimental attitude. We've got to be men and women, like I said last night, men and women that have some guts and that come to the cross and face what this book says and go forward. And our faith fails us not. Jesus prayed for Peter and he said, Satan is going to sift you. But he said, I pray that your faith will fail you not. In Luke 22, 31 through 33. And this is the issue. When the Word of God dwells richly in our hearts and we attend unto what God says, our faith fails us not. You know what? We ought to love the Lord so much that we just want to be with Him and want to embrace Him. I mean, I, I, I think I love the Lord so much this morning that you couldn't make me anxious if everything went bad today. Don't test me, Lord, but I... Uh, I I think I do. The <clears throat> just uh, just like the lady, <clears throat> just like the young lady that lost her husband in the Vietnamese in the Vietnam War, and uh, we was in uh, Ames, <clears throat> Ames, New York. We we're in Ames, New York, on ten days ten days of meetings with Dr. Logston was speaking half the time, and I was speaking half the time, and uh, we were there, <clears throat> and on a Saturday night, <clears throat> at, uh, at about midnight, when we went down to pray in that church where the conference was being held, uh, it was a beautiful, starry Saturday night, and there was this girl and she was in the church all alone, right by the altar. And no one was around, and it was midnight, and she was there. And we did not want to disturb her, but we wanted to find out uh, exactly what she was praying for, what her burden was. And coming closer to her, and she didn't know notice us because she was occupied with with worshiping God and was saying certain things to Jesus. And she said, Lord, why did you take him? She said, I love him so much. I miss him so much. I can't stand to live without him. And she said, why did you take him? And she would weep. And then she would kneel by that altar and then worship God and say, but I understand, Lord, and I love you with all my heart. And then she'd say it again. Lord, why did you take him? We had so many plans. We loved each other so much. Why did you take him? The story behind it was that she had had a husband that she was engaged to be married to that was killed that week Friday morning, and it was a Saturday night, in the Vietnamese War. And uh, the one that she loved so much had died in the war, and she was just heartbroken because her fiancé had gone home. And then she would come back. We went out of the church. She would come back, go up the center of the church, and say it again. 
And then she'd worship the Lord some more and say she understood. Then she'd walk outside of the church and started going down the walkway and stopped in the middle, looked up this fast, cried some more, and then she said, I love him so much, and I miss him so much. And all I could think of was that's exactly the attitude that we should have toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We should miss him so much, love him so much, embrace him so much, want to be with him so much, that he so occupies us that we're not frustrated when something that we desire in our ministry isn't fulfilled because everything is Jesus. That we're not disconcerted when little details do not arise in our lives as we desire them to, but we desire to simply embrace and worship and love Jesus Christ. She loved her fiancé so much. And the conflict was that she couldn't stand to lose him. And she loved him and loved him and loved him. And she she just felt that he was everything. And she loved God with all of her heart, too. But that's the way that God would certainly have us to approach him. To love him so much that we want to be with him, that we want to embrace him, and that we care to have him all the time in our presence and in our fellowship. And the Lord Jesus Christ deserves this. And we'll honor that when we attend unto the things that he speaks. In this chapter, the 16th chapter, after she had her heart open, then she was baptized. Every born-again believer ought to be baptized by immersion. So many of our sacred things that God has told us to do have been cast aside through the devil. Baptism doesn't save us, but you can't show me a Christian that had an opportunity and the thief on the cross didn't. But you cannot show me a Christian that had an opportunity that did not get baptized in the book of Acts as soon as they were born again. Sprinkling is not baptizing people. That is unscriptural, not from the Word of God. There's nothing in the Hebrew, there is nothing in the Greek that credits it to be baptism. It loses its entire significance. It, it betrays the beauty of what it means and forfeits the right to identify in the reality of what salvation is. Now, in Romans, the sixth chapter, when the Word of God says in verse 4 that we are buried with Him in baptism, it means exactly what it says. We're buried with Him in baptism. When it says we're planted in the likeness of His death in the seventh verse and raised in the likeness of resurrection, it explains baptism. Buried, planted, and raised. Not a thing about sprinkling. And a lot of people would, would come in to say, that the mode isn't important. Yes, it is. If Jesus Christ tells me how to do something, then it's important. It doesn't save me, but it's sure important that I do it God's way. I will not discredit. I will not let anybody tell me that it doesn't matter how you're baptized. It does matter. If I was a preacher and I hadn't been baptized by immersion, I'd get baptized by immersion tomorrow night or Sunday for sure. The reason is that baptism does not save me, but it sure reveals that I have a heart that's saved from self and that I'm willing to obey God. And every single time when a person got saved, he then got baptized. He didn't wait five months, two years. He didn't, he didn't consider it to be lightly because he was commanded by God to be baptized. Repent every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and be baptized. Now, baptismal regeneration is not in our teaching, but baptism after conversion is. We, we believe this, that baptism reveals many things. It is more than just an ordinance. It's an obedience to Jesus Christ's command. When we get out in that water and we're buried in it, it's a type of our old man being crucified with Christ. It's a type of, we are spectacles under the angels. In 1 Corinthians 4, 9, 
under the spirits of just men made perfect, in Hebrews 12, 22 and 3, under the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we are also spectacles to the world. When we go down in that water, we are identifying with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. Now, while the real baptism is spiritual, by the same token, you can't separate the spiritual from the physical because everything goes together as one. And you preachers, you preach baptism. If you don't, you're not preaching all the truth. You teach that people ought to be baptized because I think it's ex Jack Hiles has said, and he does not believe in baptismal re regeneration, but I have great respect for what he said because what he says is biblical. Jack Hiles says that he feels that people are actually weak and sleeping because they refuse to be baptized when God told them to. And he said it's a commandment from the Word of God. Now, to be baptized by immersion and to come out of that water, and Jesus went down in the Jordan River and came out, he was not sprinkled. There was nothing about Jesus that was sprinkled in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Jesus was immersed. Nobody that ever has their right mind, except if they were sentimental, toward a religious background, no one would ever accept sprinkling as a mode for baptism. It is important that we be immersed. It is important that we be buried. It is important that we enter into the biblical way of doing it. Because it's not just something for me. It's something for the angels looking in under the redemption. It's something for the demons to get mad at. It's something for the Trinity to observe and have a great time while you're doing it. You see, these things are more than meets the eye. And this, in, in Ephesians 3, 10, the demon world hates anything that you reveal. When you get baptism, you reveal obedience. You reveal you know that you're in a union. You reveal it. You manifest it with an act, an act of faith by obedience. And every child of God ought to be baptized just as soon as they believe with all their heart. I wouldn't give a nickel for your obedience if you can't be baptized. If you didn't know that, if you didn't understand that, then the, the blood has covered you. But now you do. You better get baptized. And uh, I, uh, I just think it's so biblical. You get saved. Listen, you say, what happens when I was baptized when I was a child? doesn't count. Nothing. Show me one verse where it counts. Dedicating a child to an altar. You see... Biblical, when Jesus was taken to the temple, and Samson and Samuel and these men of God were taken, this was a dedication. And this is like we have here, people bringing small babies and saying, we want to dedicate them to God. You know what I do when they do that? I ask the parents, are they dedicating their lives? The baby can't do much, but the parents can. I'm saying, this isn't a baby dedication, this is a parent dedication. I'm not interested in a ceremonial baby dedication. That baby is safe until he reaches the age of accountability. Then he's got to get saved like everybody else. But until then, he's safe and would go to heaven if he died. Because suffer little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God, even before they have the ability to receive because of their age. But a ch parents ought to be dedicated to train up their child in the way he should go. In Proverbs 22.6. So parents need to present their bodies a living sacrifice in Romans 12, 1 and 2 by faith. And so when someone comes and they said, I want to dedicate our child, I'll say, you mean you want to dedicate yourself to bring up the child? And they said, that's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. And because uh, I, I don't think the baby can do much about his dedication uh, personally. Uh, you, know, you promise to follow Jesus all the days of your life. Ugh. Uh, uh, and so, and if you don't, if you can't talk, but you're going to obey me, cry. Ah! So uh, it's beautiful. So what it, what it is, it's it's a parental dedication. So you are ever, so you folks getting married when you have your children, just remember. You come and say, oh, we want to give our lives to God tomorrow night for the baby, <laughs> you know, to bring up the child. And we'll say, great. And we'll have a parent dedication time. And uh, praise God. Well, 
she was baptized, and I love the next verse, the next few words, and her whole household. It's amazing that in this chapter we get the idea that when somebody got saved, they weren't afraid to go and get their household right. They didn't pray 20 years and hoping that God would do it later. They went and got them saved immediately. Now, naturally, many of us cannot do that because people aren't ready in our household, but at least they went home and tried it. You know, a lot of people take months and months and months before they dare to witness to anybody in the home. They seem to be ashamed to share the gospel with them. And listen, remember this. Now is the accepted time in Second Corinthians 6, 2. And boast not thyself for tomorrow, for man knoweth not what a day brings forth in Proverbs 27, verse 1. With that in mind, keep this in, in tune with what you're thinking, that we ought to win our loved ones at home. I remember someone wrote a song. I think it was John Rice. And it was live, uh, Win Your Loved Ones to Jesus. That was the name of it. It's a good song. Win Your Loved Ones to Jesus. We had a, after preaching about our loved ones one night in a church I was in, everybody went out that night. Hundreds went home and made telephone calls. All the circuits were busy for several hours. They tried to win their loved ones on the phone from our church service. We preached the message. We sobbed together, weeped together, loved together, got on our knees together, and said how important it was to win our loved ones. And all of us went to service. I wrote letters to my family, and uh, they, they wrote letters and used the phones. And the phones were all jammed, and we're all telling our loved ones how to be saved. And it was a beautiful thing. And some did get saved. But I want you to see that we are indebted to our loved ones, and I hope that you write them, and write a lot of letters and try to get your loved ones saved. And your old cronies and your old friends. And, and try to get them saved. Don't take for granted they're going to go to heaven. Now, if a person was drowning, you wouldn't take for granted that he was going to be at well without your help. If a person was burning in a fire and the, the house was on fire, you wouldn't take it for granted he could get out. You'd help him. A lot of people have been sucked in by Satan to take it for granted that people are going to get saved without their help. Don't be intimidated by their reaction if they reject your witness. You witness to them and you share Christ with them and, and don't take it for granted that they're all right. You help anyway and let your faith fail you not. All right. Verse 15, she got saved, baptized, got her house saved, and then started a Bible study. By the way, do you suppose she's on one of our hundred Bible studies? But she, she was quite a lady. She meant business with God. She threw away her tranquilizers. She threw away her past religious associations and got into business with Jesus. Now notice verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, when somebody gets saved, the devil always reacts. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us. And she cried, These men are the servants of the Most High God. <laughs> And they preach salvation. Wasn't that wonderful? She, boy, probably some churches would say, "Wow, we got another member of our church." She believes the way we do in salvation. She's following us. She thinks we're men of God. Verse eighteen. This did she many days. That must have got sickening. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, being grieved and sick of hearing it, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And Paul did it for all night and all day and did the wiggle and did the dance. 
and, and, and did the hocus pocus with his head. Vernon? Vernon, will you come here just a moment? No, no, Vernon, you're, you're too tall. David, you come here. Vernon, you're a little too tall. You're a little too tall. Let David, that's it. Now, some of you came out of background. Some of you came out of background where you don't know what finished work means casting out the... man can do more without speaking than they can do talking all night. They rave on and on and on. Come out, and this is what they do, and this is the truth. I want, I want you to see it. They say, come out of him, come out of him, come out of him. In the name of Jesus, I know you're there. Come out. So he's about ready for a nervous breakdown. So all of a sudden, your subjective speaks, if nobody else does. And he says, I won't, I won't, I won't. <laughs> and so the speaker says, I know you have a demon of lust. How do you know? How do you know? And the show goes on. You may go now. I hope you're delivered. You see, I have been, I, it isn't that I need to go where you've been, I've been there. I've been with those crowds and I've been part of it. How long did it take Paul to get a person delivered? One sentence. It's sickening how some groups want to always cast out demons. Some groups have cast out so many demons. They used to have 400 in their psalms and hymns and gifts nights, and they only got 50 now. Cast out 350 demons the last three years. <laughs> they got so busy casting out, some people got scared, and they said, I thought I'd get rid of demons, but a woman came up to me last night and she said she thought I still had one left. <laughs> then they wake up in the middle of the night and they see all these things in the windows and they see the demons in the bedroom. They go to bed with demons. They get up with demons. They fear demons. And every once in a while they enjoy Jesus in between getting delivered. I want to say this, and I want to say it plain. I've been that route. We have cast out demons many times. They have named themselves many times. We have witnesses when we've done it galore. But I want to say this. That is childish. That is naive. That is absolutely ridiculous and repulsive and obnoxious. If I can't cast a demon out in a sentence, then you won't see me saying the second one. And if I can't, it's not because of the demons, and you don't start looking around to see if somebody's got sin. Something must be wrong with your authority. Maybe you're not under it. Well, let's see how long it took Paul. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out of her at the same hour. It wasn't an all-night meeting at all. And when her master, by the way, he didn't even tell it to go on the sea this time. He just said, come out of her and trusted God to take care of it. I remember one night we cast out demons and somebody said, I'm awfully scared in there. Those demons came out and they said, you didn't even cast it into the sea. I said, no, but God will put it where my sins are. And they're, they're in the sea, so you know. <laughs> God cast my sins in the sea. I'm sure that he'll throw the demons the same place, you know. I didn't tell him to put my sins in the sea either, but he did. When her master saw her, saw that the hope of her of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace and the rulers. People don't like to have what they've gained gone, do they? 
you preach against certain sins long enough and somebody's doing it, they'll either get right or never come back. I, it's interesting nights when, I, when the gift of knowledge comes in here and I'll start preaching. I'll turn, message will turn right around into a sin message because God will show me how some people are living in the congregation. And all of a sudden you discover that through the friends of the friends and through the people and so on, that they didn't like the service. Because when they went out to commit adultery that night, it was awful hard to do. And adultery wasn't nearly as easy to commit anymore. Because a fellow got up and said that fornication over and over again, by the way, fornication, unlawful sex, it isn't this business, unmarried with unmarried. Fornication me, takes in incest. It takes in uh, everything. Fornication takes in everything, the whole work. And adultery comes under fornication. But everything is fornication when it's not between a man and his wife in the sacred marriage bed. It is fornication. Now, there is about 62 references that anyone that lives in fornication will go to hell. And they say it crystal clear with different Hebrew and Greek words that anyone that lives in fornication will definitely go to hell. So, who wants to live in fornication? Who wants to trade heaven for a few minutes of physical lust? Now, the amazing thing of it is, when you preach like that, the people that are committing fornication don't come back to the services. Either that or they come back, of course, and get right and repent. I remember one night, we said there's a couple right here, uh, about four, four weeks ago Sunday night, we said there's a couple right here committing adultery. And uh, the first second that we gave the invitation, the lady raised her hand. Total strangers to the ministry. Didn't know their name. But the Lord said, there's a couple to your left that are living in adultery. As far as I know, they could have been married, but God said they're not. And they've been coming back. So I assume that they quit, I hope. But, you see, when Jesus Christ is working and the gift of knowledge comes. You don't have to parade it in front of everybody. You just have to speak what God reveals, and then it does its thing with the people it's supposed to, without getting a whole lot of other people introspective. Okay. When somebody is losing something that means gain to them, They don't like it. I'm amazed that we've kept as many as we have after messages like last night. Those kind of messages have been needed to be preached for years, consistently. You know, you can't preach a message and then let up. You've got to preach it till it does one of two things. Gets the people right or makes them face the fact that they, that they don't want to get right. And if, you, if the claims of Christ aren't penetrating in that level, you're failing your responsibility to stewardship of the discipleship of Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes certain claims crystal clear. And people that don't want to go that far can't take it. But you know what? That's why many went back and followed Jesus no more in John 6.66. 6, and sooner or later, people's attitudes will be, yes, Lord, or no, Lord. Verse 20. Then brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. 
are always, cities always feel that Christians trouble them. And by the way, Christians always feel governments trouble them, you know. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Roman. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. <laughs> Here we go again, another beating party. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if they ever beat you for persecution and you just gave them that precious, that precious laugh, And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Beat them, many stripes, ran off their clothes. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, in the 25th verse, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto the Lord. I think this is such a precious and beautiful scene. Because you're going on missionary journeys. And the way things are today, you just might get beaten too. And uh, you just might have the same trouble the next three to four years. Very well could have. They put them in the inner prison. What should we do when we're in the inner prison? Pray. 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 <laughs> Learn how to pray. If you're in an inner prison situation, you married men or you married women, you pray. You feel that it's midnight and it's black as it can be and the situation is as dark as it is, then you pray. You pray. Don't faint, pray in Luke 18, 1. Pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Learn how to pray. Don't pray with tension. Don't pray with strife. Don't pray with fear. Pray with faith. Don't pray with a double mind. Pray with a single eye. Learn how to pray. Learn how to pray. Men ought always to pray and never to faint. And that's so true. If God's man is going to be strong for the inner prison situation, he must learn how to pray and faint not. Don't rationalize. Don't do a lot of talking. Don't go around moping and depressed. Don't go around like a driving spirit demon with your mother or father. Just learn how to pray. Don't go around with anxiety, but learn how to pray and faint not. I wonder how many of God's people have learned how to pray and pray without fainting. Some people pray, but they faint while they pray. And fainting while they pray, make sure that their prayers aren't answered. Pray without fainting, without getting weak in your soul, without getting weak in your faith, without fainting in your spirit. Pray. All right. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And secondly, they sang praises unto God. They didn't pray with a bad negative outlook. They sang praises to God. Their audience was God. And they sang praises. And after that, the Word of God says, And the prisoners heard them. Now, do you realize there's always prisoners that hear our prayers? And there's always prisoners that hear our singing. And a lot of people become prisoners after they hear some people sing. But it's a, but we, uh, here's Paul, and his body is beaten, and the scar is on his back, and perhaps uh, he's in terrible pain, and Silas is in terrible agony. And Paul, right there in that inner prison at midnight, simply said to Silas, what do you say? We pray. And Silas says, I'm hurting. And Paul said, let's pray. And Silas said, don't you know I'm hurting? And Paul said, but we can go to God with this thing. And Silas said, you go to God with it. I'm smiling all over. And uh, so, 
some people are occupied with their smartings and some people are occupied with being smart. But I, Paul said, listen, let's sing praises to the Lord. And Silas said, really, Paul, you're going to sing? <laughs> Paul, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul's speech was contemptible. Uh, church history tells us he had a squeaky voice. So when Paul sang, God bless him, he was a sweet aunt. When he sang, it went like this. I love you. And the prisoners heard it. <laughs> so they're having a beautiful prayer meeting and they're singing and they're praying away. Lord, we love you. You could open the door of this prison, can't you? We love you. If you don't want the Romans to kill us, they won't, will they? Lord. <laughs> so. And then Paul, in the beautiful fervency of faith, because his faith didn't fail him, and then the old apostle said, And now, Silas, we prayed, let's sing. <laughs> you know what happened? The angels of God got so excited with Paul's new way of singing. Here it is. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. And Silas probably said, I know you shouldn't have sung. <laughs> so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. <laughs> really and truly, you know, he did have a squeaky voice. That's the honest God's truth. And he did sing with a squeaky voice. That's the honest truth. I've read that clearly in church history. I've heard it from Robert Thiem, and I read it in 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. That's what it means there. But the whole point is this. It's amazing how that making a joyful noise means what it says. And God judges the heart. But it's a precious thing that that earthquake came and the Lord responded to their worship responded to their song, and responded to their praise. I, I feel that providing it's based upon the Word of God, it is so vital to teach people how to pray and worship, how to pray and worship, and how to sing and worship and make melodies unto the Lord. And it's so vital because it's the art of, of getting to express your heart attitude toward God in your weakness, in your frailty, but with your fervency of meaning, with the intensity of your love, with the desire of your initiation, you are initiating to God. You are initiating to Him. He does so much to us on initiation. There's very little that anybody could ever do for Him, but it's something we can do to Him. We can worship Him. We can really adore Him. We can really embrace Him. And we can really simply, uh, totally and completely love Him in worship and prayer and singing. And that's why it is so vital. The earthquake came. The foundation of the prison was shaken. And Jesus Christ responded to their beautiful worship. I feel bad for people that don't learn how to worship that don't learn how to pray, that don't learn how to sing in adversity and sing in the prison circumstances of their lives. I remember in, in that same meeting in New York that we were in for that 10 days, a man came to, that, to the other pastor and he said, I'm going to leave my wife. And the pastor was shocked. He said, you are an engineer. You're a famous radio personality. He said, you're, you're my deacon in the church. He said, you're a fantastic Christian. He said, your testimony and reputation is without spot. 
He said, what do you mean, sir? And he wept. The pastor wept. Dr. Logston wept. He said, and by the way, Dr. Logston used to be pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, the largest church in Pennsylvania, and the largest church in Canada. And when I was with him preaching, he, he had memorized all of Jeremiah, all of Malachi, and some very strange books. And he just let them ribble the whole week. And uh, so I stuck to the New Testament. I had that pretty well memorized, and I preached in the New, and he memorized the Old. And he'd give him the Old one sermon, and I'd give him the New the next. And we kept it going the whole ten-day period. But uh, this guy said, he said, I can't believe it. What will our church people think? What will uh, people going to say? You're one of the best couples in our church. What do you mean you're going to leave your wife? And he looked at Dr. Logston right in the eye, and tears came down his cheeks. He said, Sir, I'm sorry, but I'm going to leave my wife. And Dr. Logston says, But you have no biblical grounds for that. And then he said two words as he sobbed and wept in front of Dr. Logston's, he said, insulting silence. And Dr. Logston says, what you mean? And he said, my wife does not speak for days to a time. He said, I go home to dinner. She never talks. I go home to supper. She never talks. She never talks. And Dr. Logston said, do you ever initiate? He said, I do. I try to take her out. I go shopping with her. I call her, but he said she never says a word. He said it's always silent. She never responds. He said, I've got to have somebody respond to me. I'll die. Insulting silence. Insulting silence. And Dr. Logston looked up to God and when the fellow left, he looked me in the eye and he said, the Holy Spirit is convicting me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, God has done so much for me all my years. And he said, I had cancer and I was ready to die. He said, I preached my last sermon. I left a note and the doctor said, I would last for three months. I had cancer on the last stage. And he said, I preached my last message. I left the pulpit that night. And he said, I was winded and I knew it was all over. I wrote a letter to my wife and I said, I have preached my last sermon. I met a guy who is in the Word of Life organization. He's a well-known man. He was a general uh, of some kind. And he told me about Dr. Peterson's uh, natural food clinic in, in Florida, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he said, I, I finally thought I've got nothing to lose. It's not supposed to cure cancer, but it's preventive medicine. They don't, they don't claim to do anything except to help you not get cancer. But he said, I had it in the last stage, so I went anyway. I went down there, got a motel room, went into the place. They tested my blood, did everything for me, and said, we don't claim that we're going to help you because you've got cancer in the last stage. Keep on. But they said, nevertheless, we want you to go on this kind of a diet. They, they did what they call the chemistry of blood analysis. Everything they did was through the blood. And they so fantastically uh, helped Dr. Logston. The man that's ahead of that was the head of Leahy Clinic, and the Duncan Hines Foundation hired him to go to St. Petersburg and set up this clinic because they feel, felt that thousands of people were dying from sugar and from bleached flour and from salt and from milk. And these were the four biggest killers in all the world, and uh, milk was number three, and salt was number four, and sugar was number one, and flour was number two. And these four big killers were killing people. And Dr. Logston obeyed what they told him and got completely cured. He said, God cured me. He said, I'm 68. He said, I can walk five miles. I'm completely cured. He said, I stay right on uh, the doctor's uh, recommendations. He said, they say, don't call it a diet. It's not a diet. It's a way of eating. And he said, I stayed on it. I don't have any milk, no sugar, none of that flour. And they've got everything going in my bloodstream. He said, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you get your blood straight, you're going to be healthy. And he said, they did everything by my blood. Everything they did was through the blood. He said, they had some more, some of the most amazing ways of analyzing blood that I never thought, never read about, and never knew about in all my years of studying medical books and medical journals. And he said, God used them to totally heal me. 
He said, when you're breathing one night and you're told that you've got less than three months, you preach your last sermon, and then you're healthy at 67 and can walk five miles, he said, you've got something to be thankful about. And all because of what God did in St. Petersburg, Florida. And so, Dr. Logston said, uh, after that, I began dwelling on that all the time because after all, God used it to save my life. And he said, when it came to worship, when it came to praise, I gave God insulting silence. And he began to weep. And he said, that illustration of this couple, one of our finest couples in the ministry, he said, insulting silence. And he said, can you imagine, Pastor? He said, how God looks down from heaven and sees scores of people murmuring every day, going about with funny-looking, depressed faces because something didn't happen their way. He said, they are living in the prison sentences of their own confinements. And he said, they give God insulting silence. Jesus Christ and the angels are singing before the Lord. He said, and the pleasures of God are at his right hand, but they are silent. They go around dwelling on their own problems. He said, imagine, that man's emotions have come to the end of his rope because his wife never responds to him. He doesn't know what it is to have a wife that will respond consistently. He doesn't know what it is to converse back and forth, insulting silence. She just withdraws, 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 and has for years. He said, I knew they had a problem. I didn't know it was that serious. And he said, but I, he said, the thing that makes me weep is the years that I have lived as a preacher before God, and I prepared my sermons, and I preached my messages, but I have responded with insulting silence in personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And he said, I want to repent. In front of you, he said, I want to repent in front of God and test God to forgive me for, for not responding to the many initiations that he's given me day after day. He healed me of cancer, and I was sure to die, but he's done more than that. He gave me the largest church in Canada. He gave me the largest church in America at one time. He's made me an evangelist and a conference speaker that has booked up three years in advance. But he said, I have given God recently insulting silence. Paul and Silas prayed. Paul and Silas sang. And God caused an earthquake to release them from prison. And the prison is heard. Paul and Silas proved that their hearts were not in prison because they didn't go anywhere. And the Philippian jailer came trembling and shaking thinking that he would be put to death because of what had happened, but not much caring anymore. And he came before them and bowed down and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? When we live right, when we praise God, when we worship God, the prisoners are going to hear. Our enemies will turn into converts many times. Those that dislike us will turn into people that will say, Please help me with the gospel. What must I do to be saved, he said. And it was such a beautiful story. It was so much like God, who takes the curse and turns it into a blessing, who takes the wrath of God to please men in Psalm 76.10, the curse and turns it into a blessing in Numbers 23.21. It's so much like God to do that when people worship and praise Him and love Him and trust Him and pray and don't think. And immediately the jailer got his family saved and wiped the stripes that where Paul and Silas had been wounded and served them. And his whole family was baptized that night by immersion. And what a night that was. Beaten for the gospel's sake. Stripes for the gospel's sake. In a prison for the gospel's sake. Singing for the gospel's sake. Praising God for the gospel's sake. An earthquake for the gospel's sake. Initiation, response. Initiation, response. Response, initiation. That's how God wants it. And then the prisoners here. The, the jailer gets saved. And people are added to the church because they knew how to initiate even when they were in a prison with no response. Let's bow our heads.